Beautiful. All right, welcome to SQL Server Execution Plans. My name's Drew, and I'm a senior DBA at a little company called IGS in Dublin. You may have heard of us, and hopefully you're all customers. A little bit about me before we get going. I've been using the Microsoft Data Platform for about 10 years now, and I've really fallen, I've really fallen in love with it, and I kind of got introduced to it when I was a developer way back when, and I was a really terrible developer, so I just decided to get, it, to get into the DBA game instead. Uh, also at IGS, I do things around release management and DevOps. Those are like really good buzzwords, so I have to include them in a slide. Um, my contact information is up there. Don't worry about writing down my email address. My last name is a burden. So if you really want to contact me by email, I have business cards. Just see me afterwards. My Twitter handle is Pitferg. Please feel free to reach out, tweet rude things at me. That's totally cool. Uh, I also have a website where I blog about SQL Server stuff. Probably not enough. Um, some performance tuning things and a lot of kind of automation around SQL Server if you're interested in how you can automate your deployments and release management. If you manage to get bored in this presentation, which is a real possibility because we're going to be talking about databases and nobody likes databases but me, you can head over to jeansface.com. We take pictures of my boss without his permission and we post them. And I think he would be like not okay with it if he wasn't so good looking. All right. Oh, I need to look at this monitor, not that, because that's really hard. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about SQL Server execution plans and why you should care about them, even if you're not a database administrator or even a SQL developer, for that matter. Okay? Why are these things important to us? Well, <laughs> they're important because every time you run a query, you get a query plan. And if you get a bad query plan, you're going to get bad performance. So what I want to spend some time talking about today is some common operators you will see in execution plans. And then towards the end, we'll do some demos of what it looks like when you write some bad plans and how you can do to fix them. I need to stay back here. <laughs> All right, so query plans are basically a set of instructions that get used by SQL Server every time you run a query. Now, SQL Server does what's called a cost-based optimization for your SQL queries. What does that mean? That means that every time you run a query, SQL Server looks at what you're trying to do and assigns it some number. And that number is a cost. And ironically, what happens is SQL Server actually tries to create a bunch of plans for your query, and it just chooses the one that is the least terrible in terms of cost. That cost is some number. It is greater than zero. It can be less than one, but it's, not, it's never zero or less. And every time you run a query for the first time, SQL Server takes that plan and caches it. That plan cache is where all these queries get stored until they're eventually invalidated out, maybe because other plans need to go in the cache, or you tell it, get out of my cache because you're terrible. When these plans get created, it is basically going to detail every step that the, that, the, that the storage engine, not the relational engine, is going to take to retrieve your data. So here's what happens. I've got a query in Management Studio, or I've got a query in Entity Framework, or in my code where I'm executing a stored procedure, and I kick that query off against the server. When that happens, behind the scenes, SQL Server has to take that query, and the first thing it does is it looks at it, and it makes sure it's syntactically correct. Can I parse it? Are all the commas in the right place? You know, did he type select instead of select, that type of stuff? Did I use any keywords that I shouldn't have? Once that query has been successfully parsed out, it moves over to what's called the algebraizer. And the algebraizer is what actually takes and looks at the individual objects in your query. OK, he's trying to use a customer table, or he's trying to use this view, or he's trying to use a store procedure named this. SQL Server goes in that and looks, goes into its engine and looks at it to say, yep, those are all objects that I can use. Then, when that's all done, SQL Server then generates your plan, or actually a bunch of plans, and chooses the least awful one. It looks at every single step it needs to take to go get your data. So do I need to scan a table? Do I need to do some kind of computation? Do I need to do some type of sort? Am I joining tables together? All of those become different operations in your query plan. Then when that's finally done, it takes that execution plan and moves it over to the storage engine. The storage engine is what eventually thrashes your spinning Rust disks and reads and writes to memory and schedules time on your CPUs, all that type of thing. Okay? All query tuning that you're going to do in SQL Server, if SQL Server appears slow, the first thing we do is we look at the query plan. We don't panic and say, oh, we need more resources, or we need a flash array, or we should go to NoSQL, because those are all terrible ideas. Start looking at your query plans. Okay? Don't just jump to really, really crazy conclusions until you start looking at query plans, because chances are you can find ways to tune it inside the plan. Now, like I said, SQL Server is going to make its best effort guess about how a query should be run. 
Sometimes it gets it wrong. You can override how SQL Server runs your queries with query hints. I don't recommend that. There's maybe five people in the world, and all of them are either current or former Microsoft engineers, that can actually make SQL Server do things exactly the way it should be done with query hints. I'm not one of them. And maybe someone in here is. I don't want to insult anybody. But by and large, you shouldn't try to outsmart the optimizer. So when we read execution plans, and I'll show you a, sam a sample plan here in a second, we always look at each operator and we read right to left. Why do we do that? Well, because we start as far to the right as we can in our execution plan and we just kind of follow the arrows through the plan to read it. And every operation has a cost and these costs are cumulative. So even though you may have a really simple query with a terrible sort in it, that sort is gonna bubble up its cost to the total operation and then that's why that query is terrible. Each operation also has an arrow that connects it to each individual thing. That arrow will show you how data is flowing between your operations, what columns are moving where, are things being computed, what's the size of the data moving between operations. It also shows you if your statistics are out of date. Now, one thing about SQL Server is it maintains a list of column statistics about your indexes, about your tables, everything behind the scenes. It knows how often a particular term shows up, how dense a particular index is. It needs to know that so when it comes up with its execution plan, it knows the best way to drive that plan to get your data. And you can get all this information from tooltip pop-ups in your query plans, but if you really want to go deep, there's also properties windows inside of SSMS to view your data. All right, so let's look at a real, sample, real simple sample plan. Okay? I have a select statement where I'm gonna select some columns from a human resources table because that's where the juicy data is. And I wanna join that to my person table on a business entity ID. So these are two primary key columns that I'm gonna to join to in SQL Server. If I were to run this in code or if I were to run this in Management Studio, what's going to happen? Well, the minute I hit F5, depending on which execution plan option I have enabled in Management Studio, I'm gonna get a result that kind of looks like this, okay? If we read right to left, we start at the top and we see I'm doing a clustered index scan, which we'll talk more about in a minute, from my employee table, which then has to be joined via a nested loop join from, and then I follow my nested loop to my next node to say, I'm doing a clustered index seek on my business, and, or I'm sorry, on my person table, and then joining those all together and eventually returning it back to the client or the person or whoever requested this data. Now, there's two types of execution plans in SQL Server. The first is an estimated plan, and the second is an actual plan, represented by the icons I have up here. The one on the right is if you want to get an estimated plan, I would click that button. If I want an actual plan, I'm going to click the left-hand button. Well, what's the difference? Well, an estimated plan is just that. What it does is it takes your query, parses it, algebraizes it, and compiles it, but doesn't run it. When that happens, SQL Server can take that query and look at it, and decide, you know, here's how I think I'm going to run this query. A lot of times, it's exactly the same as the actual plan. But what SQL Server doesn't know is how much actual data is going to flow through this operation. It makes a guess. And that guess is what drives the plan overall. Okay? The opposite side of that is your actual plan. If you're doing real in-depth query tuning, you should be using the actual plan because you're actually going to execute the query and you're actually going to get statistics back about your data and what actually happened. Okay? The downside there, of course, is you actually have to run your query. So if you've got some terrible query that's sucking a lot of wind and it takes five minutes or ten minutes or a half an hour or some batch process that takes all night, it's going to take a while for that execution plan to come back. So you kind of need to know the difference of, okay, I kind of want to get a feel for if there's any general things I can do in my tuning with my estimated plan. But as I start making changes, if you really want to see improvement when you start tuning queries, you're going to want to use your actual plan. All right. So we've talked about execution plans, what they are, how they get generated, how we, re how we read them. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the more common operations you're going to see in query plans and what they mean. So in order to do that, we're going to try to alt-tab out of this guy. That's always an adventure. All right, because, you know, PowerPoint. OK, so for my demos today, guys, I'm using SQL Server 2016. OK, I'm really excited about SQL Server 2016. Uh, real quick show of hands, because I'm always generally curious about this. Who's using SQL Server 2014 in production? All right, that's great. What about SQL Server 2012? 
More hands. All right, this, this is where it gets a little dicey. What about SQL Server 2008 R2? OK, I know. I get it. I still have some, too. What about SQL Server 2005? You poor guys. I'm sorry. Hanging on, right? <laughs> I'm not even going to ask about SQL Server 2000, because I'll crawl under this table. All right, SQL Server 2016 is going to be awesome. And if I can squeeze it in here, it's hard to work it into the demos. I'm going to show you some really cool stuff that's coming in SQL Server 2016. I'm also using the AdventureWorks database. It's Microsoft's publicly available database. Really great for demos because they do everything in it because it's a product demo. It's got foreign keys, and it's got XML indexes and triggers and all the things that make databases great. Uh, so we'll be using that data for the most part of it. I also have some Stack Overflow data so we can see how data scales when we really start to go from like 20,000 rows to like 28 million rows. OK, so let's start with some simple selects here. You guys can all see that good in the back, right? All right, you're about to not see it really good. So I'm going to do some selects here. Now, up here at the top, you'll notice, let me zoom in a little bit, woo, Windows 10. Uh, I have my actual execu execution plan selected up here. If I wanted to get my estimate, I would click here. Okay. Remember that if I, click my ex if I click my estimated plan, I get a plan immediately. If I do my actual plan, I get it after my query is run. Okay, so I did that, and I actually got query results. I got a lot of query results, because I ran like five or six different queries here, and I got different row result sets for each. So let's look at the execution plan tab, which is over here. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, and I'm going to zoom in. All right, good? Read that? All right. So my first query, good old select star. <laughs> You're going to hear about how much I hate select star for a little bit. Select star from production.product. Give me everything out of the production.product table. SQL 101, right? Let's just use select star because it gives me everything. So what's happening in this particular query? Well, this is the most basic query you could ever see in SQL Server. What it's telling me is go to this table, which is the product table, scan the clustered index and return all the data back. So when I mouse over this guy, I get some information about this particular operation. I can see how many rows SQL Server read. I can see how many rows SQL Server thought it was going to read. That's what the estimated number of rows is. Keep that in the back of your head, because that's going to come back to haunt us later. We can see how expensive the query is. Estimated operator cost. I've heard that number described as query bucks. I've heard, I've heard that number described as a Microsoft reference machine number. It has no real world value. Okay. In fact, if I were to give you this query in this database and you'd run it on your laptop, you may even get a different cost than me. Because maybe I have more memory than you, or I have more CPUs than you, or maybe there's, the data is already in memory. It's hard to say. But that number is a reference of how expensive that query is. And when you run multiple queries in the same batch, so I can see here that this query was roughly 0% of my total query batch cost. I didn't have any goes or semicolons in the way. And if I start scrolling down, I can see where the more expensive queries were in my plan. This is really important when you're writing things like stored procedures that have multi-step operations. You can see where your more, extensive step, or more expensive steps are. So why is this a clustered index scan? What does that mean? Well, a clustered index scan is one of the most basic operations in SQL Server. Remember that if I have a table and I create a primary key on it, that is how my data gets rearranged and stored in SQL Server. So that means I'm scanning the entire table, a clustered index scan, and returning every single row. If I mouse over my little arrow here, I also get some intelligence about how much data is flowing back to the client. Yeah? Oh, man, that's terrible. Who's parked in the Bed Bath & Beyond parking lot? Yeah, you're going to want to go move your car. They're going to tow you. <laughs> that sucks. Sorry. By the way, you guys should all tweet this to like the Cinemark companies, because this is their doing, not ours. So really give them some hate tweets. Sorry, guys. I guess, I, I, yeah, I, I'm assuming I'm OK. I, I think that's where I am. So if my car's not there, I'm going to be pretty mad. Because I really can't go move mine right now. All right. Sorry, guys. Again, tweet your hate to the rave company. 
All right, so that's what that clustered index scan means. Now, the operation below it is a table scan. Why is that different? Well, all I did here is I created another table in a different schema called product archive, but I didn't put a primary key on it. If you see a table scan, that means SQL Server's reading data from a table that doesn't have a primary key. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Drew? Well, it depends. My favorite answer to give is a DBA. Table scans are not themselves terrible if you're reading every row from it, because it's just all sequential reads off of disk. Whatever order it's in on the disk, we don't care. We're not ordering it. We're not filtering it. We're not doing any sort of predicates with it. They're great. But if you're going to be joining to that table, you probably don't want to do table scans, because that gets to be really terrible when it tries to go and get it later. Now, my next query I have here is select star from sales.customer. It doesn't look so simple, but why? It's not syntactically different than my other query, and I didn't do anything where it looks like I'm computing scalars in this thing. How can I find out what's going on? Well, let's start right to left again. I have a clustered index scan on my customer table. Then it pipes over about 20,000 rows to a compute scalar. What's a compute scalar? It's exactly what it sounds like. It needs to do something to every row in my result set before I return it back to the client. Oh, apparently if you're parked at Roosters, you need to move too. I love going first, by the way. We can work all this stuff out as we go. <laughs> it's all right. I don't want anybody to get their car towed. That would, that would be terrible. Um, don't tweet bad things at Roosters, though, because they have really good wings. All right. So I'm doing a compute scalar, but what am I doing from a compute scalar? Well, in order to really dive into this, we need to look at the properties window, because I certainly didn't write anything that needs to compute any data in my result set. Over here in my properties window, I can get more information about what the actual operations are. Okay? This is pretty much everything that's in my tooltip, but it has more. So if I want to dig into this particular compute scalar, I can start expanding these nodes, right? and I can see what the scalar operator is from this guy, or I can make it not so terrible if I do this. Go in here. Oh, well, let me select it. Go here. So what I can see that it's doing is it wants to do some sort of function in my query. Where the heck did that come from? Well, I then have to go look at <clears throat> the actual table where this was created. And if I go into my object explorer and expand databases, AdventureWorks, and look at the table, sales.customer. I have a computed column in my table. It's not persisted. What does that mean? That means that every time I select from this table, I need to spend CPU cycles to calculate an account number. Okay? We can see that represented as a cost in our query down here, that 97% of the total work we're doing for this query is actually getting the data off of the disk. But I've got a roughly 4% of my total query is being done in compute scalars. And by the way, the reason there's two compute scalars there is if I were to script out this table real fast, and look at the individual information in it, I can see that my account number is indeed a computed column, but it's actually got two functions in it. One, the first is an is null returning the value that isn't null, or if it is null returning an empty value, I should say. Or, if it is, concatenate the letters AW and then add some leading zeros to the customer number. So that's the compute scalar happening there. It's actually two operations because it's a computed column. OK, back to this. So let's say I want to start filtering. Okay? What if I start using predicates? I do a where clause in my query. What does that look like? Well, scroll down a little bit here. So select star from person.person. .person where person type is employee. What does that plan look like? You would think it's going to be different, but it's not. I still do a clustered index scan. Why? Well, Drew, I thought indexes are great, and that's why we do where clauses. Yeah. But I don't have an index on employee type on this table, so it can't do anything. SQL Server still says, hey, guy, I'm still going to go to my clustered index and return every row and then filter out all the data. And that's really expensive. This is the most expensive query in our batch. Even though I'm using a where clause, it doesn't make any sense. It kind of does, though. Because I don't have an index, I still need to thrash my disk to pull everything out of it. 
And by the way, estimated row size, how big is each row? It's each row is roughly 8K. And I'm returning back to the client, you know, roughly, I don't know, 2.6 megs worth of data. But I need to read everything off of disk first and then filter out the rows I don't want in my memory or with my CPU and then pipe that back out to the user. That's why this one's so expensive, okay? But how can we make it less terrible? All right, step one, stop using select star. If you don't need every column, don't select it. Less data back to the client, less time spent, less time spent reading from disk. So in my next example then, I change up the query a little bit. We're gonna select only the first name and last name from that table, and I'm gonna say where my last name is equal to some value. You can see it's parameterized here. This time I get an index seek operation. A seek is different than a scan in that I can go directly to only the rows I need, pull them out, and then return them to the client. And the reason that I can do that is because I have an index on that table, and we can see it's actually using the index. If I look at the object tooltip here, I can see it's using an index called person underscore last name underscore first name underscore middle name. Just a naming convention Microsoft came up with for this particular index to say it's an index on the person table ordered by last name, first name, middle name. That index order is important and we'll see why in a second. But I'm not done yet. How do we quantify how much better a seek is than a scan? Well, when you're query tuning, one thing you can do is you can turn on statistics on your I.O. I.O. is generally where most queries start to fall down. The more data I need to read, how it's ordered on my disk, how I'm joining to it, how I'm filtering it, that's where most of your cost is going to be. CPU is a close second, but most of your cost is going to come from I.O. So if we want to see improvement on how we're actually writing these queries, we can run this set statistics I.O. on statement. What does that do? Well, now let's run my same queries again, where I'm going to select star from person.person, .person, where I have the person type of employee, and then I'm also going to select star from person.person, .person, where my last name is Smith. So pop quiz hotshots, what's going to happen in my first query? Am I going to get, a, am I going to get an index scan or an index seek? <laughs> Great job, Chris Scott. I'm, going to, I'm probably going to get a scan in my first query, right? Because I'm doing select star, and I already know I don't have an index on that. But my second query, I'm doing select star where I have my person last name is equal to Smith. Do you think I'm going to see a seek or not there? Why? Boom. Select stars are terrible. Remember that. If you don't remember anything else today, there's two things I want you to remember. Select stars are terrible and cursors are bad. All right. So I, didn't get a, I did get a seek, technically, but I didn't get just a seek. Okay? Here's my two query plans for that. We'll look at that in a minute. But we can quantify how much better one query is than the other in that my first execution here did one scan, okay, meaning it scanned one object, and it had to read 3,838 pages out of memory to get my results. Why not, why not from disk? Well, SQL Server does cache things in what's called a buffer pool, and as you read data, that comes off of disk and goes into memory, stays there until there's memory pressure, old pages come out, new pages come in but I had to read roughly 4,000 of them. My second query, even though I didn't get an index seek, improved by almost a factor of 10. I had to do less I.O. Why? Well, let's look at the plan. Well, we know what the first plan is, select star from person.person .person where I don't have an index, and that's what I get. My second query isn't actually terrible, but it could be better, okay? I did get an index seek, okay? I did select from the person.person .person table, it did use my index to query by that last name, but then it had to do something else called a key lookup. In SQL Server, when you have an index and you see a seek or a scan, it's actually reading a secondary copy of your data. Every index you create on a table takes the same amount of data in your table, but only uses certain pieces or certain columns of it, and it orders it in that order. So for this particular index, it's ordering it first by last name, and then first name, and then middle name. So basically, think of it this way. I've got my main table with a clustered index that has all my columns and all my data, and it's ordered by the, by the primary key. Then I also have an index side by side, row for row, that has all the last names, then all the, middle, all, then all the first names, then all the middle names. 
That's how it's stored on disk. So it's able to go to that index and quickly seek, because it knows statistics about my columns and my index, pull back the rows I need, and then it's doing a join, even though we don't have a join operator in our table. Why? Remember that we're doing select star, and not every column is in this index. So what does SQL Server have to do? SQL Server then has to take all the results from my seek, which also includes the primary key. Every index will have your primary key in it, whether you tell it to or not. Then it has to go back to the table and do a lookup on every single row. Okay? Now we can see that this is way more better than this guy. Okay? We can see that this, query, this, this particular query took up roughly 89% of the overall query cost of this batch, where this one only took 10%. Again, select star's terrible. How can we make it not terrible? Well, if I run the other query now, so let's say I'm just doing first name, last name on Smith, and I run it. Now I just get my seek, and I only had to do four reads. Okay, way better. Okay, we improve. We basically improve by a factor of 100 every time. That statement may or may not be true because I'm really bad at math. But you can see that that number continually goes down. And that's a good thing. Okay, we're reducing our, our I.O. cost, which makes for faster queries. Now, one more little quiz. I have the same query, but this time I want to sort by first name. Or, I'm sorry, filter by first name. Okay, so I'm going to look for where first name equals Andrew. Do you think I'm going to see a seek? Nope. Because SQL Server still used that index, but it did a scan. And here's why. The index is ordered by last name. So it went into a scan because it can still read just the index instead of the whole honking table, right? But because the data is ordered first by last name and then by first name, that's not confusing, it has to scan the entire index and only return the rows where it's Andrew for the first name. And that green text right there, it's like, hey, buddy, I can make this a lot better if you create an index with first name in it. That's good old database tuning advisor, and nobody invited him. Don't always go by these recommendations, OK? I wouldn't necessarily add this index unless your application was always searching by first name for some reason. You shouldn't just blindly add these indexes. Because how much of a cost would we actually see there? Assuming we get similar performance like we did from the other query and only four logical reads, it's probably not going to be that low. It could be more, it could be less. Depends on how many times Andrew shows up in my index. This guy does 117 reads. Still better than our other query with the select star, because I don't need to read as much data. Okay. All right, next thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to turn some statistics off now, because we don't care about these anymore. So let's talk about sorts. Okay. Good old select star again. Stop hitting yourself, Drew. Select star from person.person, .person, and this time I'm going to order by the column person type. What does that plan look like? Again, with my actual plan turned on, I go to my execution plan. Now we can see the costs are try starting to be split between CPU and disk. Okay? I did a clustered index scan. I don't have any indexes up my sleeve here. I'm just pulling back every row from the person.person .person table, ordering by person type. Okay? I look at this guy, and I get some information about him. Okay? Estimated operator cost. This thing costs 2.8. SQL Server reference numbers, 68% of the query. My sort, though, is no slouch. Okay? It has an operator cost as well of 1.3, which then adds up to whatever this number is, and 4.17, and that's what it costs. I will tell you that as a DBA, if a developer comes to me and says his query is slow, the first thing I look for are sorts. Sorting in SQL Server is a very expensive operation for a couple reasons. One, it takes a lot of CPU. And a lot of times, if you have a really large data set that you're trying to sort, SQL Server's also going to start thrashing disk in its temporary database to create little hashing tables to do its sort before it eventually returns it back. We can make this query a lot better if we can eliminate the sort. How do we do that? The first thing I tell people is, well, can you sort in your code? That's generally going to be faster, I'll freely admit. Sometimes, though, we can't do that. If we have an application that's slow and we can't sit there and we can't come up with a fix on the spot, and release some code, well, what other options do we have? You can deal with sorts in a couple different creative ways in SQL, but my favorite way is with indexes. 
Sorts benefit from indexes. Remember that when I have an index, my data is sorted by whatever the indexed columns are. So in this particular query, I'm going to select first name and last name from person.person. .person, but first, I'm going to order by first name, which is not the main indexed column in that query. When I run it, what does my plan look like? I still have a sort. Because remember that that is not the column that is the main column of the index. It's first, the first column is last name, then first name, and then middle name. So I still had to do an index scan. My operator is only 8% of my, 8% of my query cost is in my index scan because I'm reading way less data. Now the most, now my most of my cost is in my sort. But we can eliminate that sort altogether with indexes. So let's say we actually use the index as it's designed, select first name and last name from person.person, .person, and this time I'm going to order by last name. When I run it, my sort is still is gone, but you'll notice that I'm still getting an index scan, even though I'm ordering by last name. Shouldn't I be getting a seek? No. I didn't use a where clause. Seeks are reserved for filtering data with predicates. I don't have one here. But the good news is my sort's gone. I still returned every row from person.person, .person, but I didn't have to spend time doing a sort because I utilized the index that was there. I selected only the columns I needed from it, and I ordered by the column that has already been indexed. So we completely eliminated that sort operation. This query gets infinitely faster right away. I don't have to release code. I just need to buy my DBA a beer. All right, so now we're going to talk about the next piece, and this is where everybody starts to ask me a lot of questions. So if you have questions, just in the interest of time, I'll talk to you afterwards. But we're going to talk about table joins, the joy of relational databases, right? What good's a, what good's a relational database if we can't do joins? There are three main join types you're probably going to see in SQL Server. Okay? The first one I want to talk about are merge joins. So let's look at my query. Select, first, select last name and first name and email address from person.person, .person, join to the person email address table on the primary key of both tables. All right, the first type of join we're going to talk about is a merge join. And a merge join you can kind of think of like almost like a riffle shuffle. If you were shuffling a deck of cards together, I take them and I shuffle them all together, they just kind of merge together. It can be a very good join if and only if your two sides of the join are ordered the same way. Merge joins rely on the fact that I have an outer and an inner set of data, and they're both sorted the same way. So that way, the merge can just instantly overlay itself on top of each other. Again, very efficient, but SQL Server needs it in that order, and it's not. So here we go again with another sort operator. I did an index seek on last name. Okay, Why? Well, because, did I actually do a predicate here? Let me scroll up a little bit. Yeah. So I actually did do where last name is equal to Smith. So I'm using my index. I did a seek, really inexpensive, any, really an inexpensive, efficient operation. But then I need to sort it. Because remember, that index isn't sorted by business entity ID. It's sorted by last name. But business entity, business entity ID, which is my primary key of my table, is in that index. So it just has to reorder that output. It then does a clustered index scan on the email address table, finding the rows that match. And then it overlays them. And I can see that here. If I scroll down so I can actually see the tooltip. Come on, Drew, you can do it. Uh, come on. Well, let's go to the properties window. That's what it's there for. Merge join. Yep, where join columns down here. Does a merge join. The residual was business entity ID equals business entity ID. Again, and this is where we start talking about why did SQL Server do this? If we know sorts are bad, why did SQL Server have to spend its time doing it if, it's, if we know sorts are terrible? Wouldn't we rewrite this so we didn't get a sort? Yeah, we could, right? We could write a different index to try to eliminate that sort operation. But then we probably wouldn't get a merge join unless we wrote an index that actually had business entity ID as the first column, which that might make our other operator terrible. Remember when I said that SQL Server actually evaluates a lot of different plans for every query? This is the least terrible one. It said, hey, guy, I'm going to do it this way because I can use a merge join. Even though I have to eat a little bit of the cost of the sort, this is still a better join for the query you're trying to write to get the data out. Okay, So merge joins just right together. <laughs> I can't wait to hear that on the playback. All right, 
So next, hash match joins. Hash match joins are usually where people start to see problems in their queries. What is a hash match join? Raise your hand if you know what a hash table is. OK, OK, everybody raise their hand. That's good. All right. When you have very large data sets joining to very large data sets, or one extremely large data set joining to one other not so large data set, you get a hash match join. A hash match join takes the smaller data set, and it creates a hash table of values. Then for every row in the larger table, it basically creates a hash for the row, and it finds the bucket that that row matches on your hash table and joins it together that way. It can be inefficient. Okay? We can see here that SQL Server is trying to be helpful again and recommending an index. If you see a hash match, sometimes that's what you're stuck with. If you have a lot of data, that's just the way life is. You know, consider, do I need that much data? Can I write my query different? Can I change my logic? Do I need everything that I'm getting? But if you've done all that, if you've done all that and you're seeing hash match joins, that's usually a key to start thinking about, can I index my data differently to reduce the reliance to reduce the reliance on uh, hash match joins. Because all of this is going on inside your temporary DB on SQL Server, tempdb, the toilet bowl of SQL Server, trademarked by Kendra Little. You should follow her on Twitter. She, uh, she calls it the toilet bowl of SQL Server. And this is a perfect example of it. Because all of, this, all of this hashing and everything actually gets written to disk and then read from disk and then joined back together. And we can see down here that SQL Server is also being helpful and doing another merge join based on how I wrote my query. The last type of join we're going to talk about is a nested loop join, which actually is nothing more than a terrible cursor in join form. But it's not. I will freely admit that I hate cursors, and I threaten to cut developers that write any true story. But this join is actually really efficient if and only if you have a very small data set compared to a very large data set. All it does is it takes that smaller data set and loops over the larger data set, comparing it to the smaller one, looking for matches. Nested loop join. I think everybody here knows what a loop is, right? It's a developer conference. Nested loops are great, but they have one major drawback. Your statistics about your queries need to be on point, because if it makes a bad decision and tries to use a nested loop when more data comes back than it was expecting, that's when you run into bad times deluxe, and you want to queue up sadtrombone.com because you're in for a bad time. What are query estimates? So let's take a moment here and look at this. So because I ran my actual, actual execution plan, I can see that SQL Server said, hey, I'm expecting 290 rows back. And it actually returned 290 rows. But there's a problem here. Actual number of rows, 290. Estimated number of rows, 1. Why the difference? Well, again, SQL Server has to make assumptions about your data before it executes the query. So in this particular case, it says, based on how you're doing this join, I estimate you're only going to get one row on this join. So hey, happy day. I only need the nested loop over one row. SQL Server said, this is the best way to do this query. But it was wrong. Okay? It actually returned 290 rows. So you have a 290 row nested loop comparing to a 290 row table. That's not still terrible, because my result sets are small, and I wouldn't fret too much about it. But if you had extremely large tables and you're getting nested loop joins every time, you're really thrashing disk, you're really thrashing memory and CPU when you shouldn't be. So nested loop joins are good if and only if your data sets are aligned the right way. And we're going to see why that's terrible here in a minute. OK. So those are joins. So now we've looked at some of the, oh, we're all tabbing again, Drew. Good luck. All right. So. We've looked at some of the more common query plan operations, okay? Seeks, scans, joins, sorts, and row lookups, okay? Those are some really common ones you're going to see in your execution plans. Now I want to spend the remaining time, which is roughly 25 minutes ish, looking at some bad queries and how we can identify them, okay? What we were just talking about with that nested row lookup, or that nested loops lookup, is it's subject to something called parameter sniffing. Who here has heard that term before? It's terrible, right? At the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how query plans get cached. So if I have a particular query that I run against a table, SQL Server first looks to the plan cache and says, do I need to recompile this query? 
okay? Because we don't want to spend time recompiling queries over and over again, because that time, depending on how busy your system is, is going to be scheduling CPUs and taking resources away from your other queries. If the plan is in memory, I'll use it. If not, I'm going to compile it and put it there. And the next time it runs, I'll use that plan. And the next time it runs, I'll use that plan until it's invalidated out. But that can lead to some interesting scenarios. So using AdventureWorks again, I have three queries here. They're identical except for the predicate. I'm selecting from an address table and I'm passing a state province ID over to it in, you know, in, my, in my select statement. When I run it and I look at my execution plan, I get two very similar queries for my first two queries. SQL Server looked at the data and said, I'm going to do an index seek. You're selecting some columns that aren't in the index, so I need to do a key lookup. We could fix this with an include. By the way, guys, one of the easiest low-hanging fruits in any query you tune is with a key lookup. If you see a key lookup, that probably means you have an index that doesn't have enough columns in it. Okay? You don't need to necessarily add them to the ordered columns of an index. You just need to add them to the included columns. Again, a very easy one to fix. You can reduce your I.O. cost just by tuning your, tuning your index a little bit. So for this particular query, SQL Server said, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do a nested loop join, because you're only returning 16 rows here, and you're returning 16 rows here. Nested loop join saves the day. But when I scroll down a little bit, for that other param for that other value I passed, it actually did an index scan. It did something way more expensive than what we had before, because SQL Server knows, again, about our column statistics and said, it's just easier for me to scan the table than to try to seek and do a, a lookup on each one of those rows. I'm just going to scan the table, because that value shows up way more than everything else. For this query, that's fine. I don't really care, because I didn't actually hard code it. I didn't parameterize it. Where things start to go south for us, though, is if we actually create a stored procedure. Okay? Let's say I wanted to create a stored procedure to do this work. Okay? Very simple. I'm only creating a stored procedure that takes in that parameter of state province ID and returns data. Super simple stuff. Let's create that. And now let's run it. Except this time, I'm going to run it for the bad plan, the one that gave us that table scan. So I'm going to run it for state specific ID number nine. I look at my execution plan, and I'm in index scan country. You know, I'm actually scanning my entire index, right? Now, that plan has been cached. So the next time I run this query, it doesn't matter what value I give it. Let's use one of the smaller ones where we saw our index seek. I'm still in a scan. Why? Remember that I have a parameterized query, so the only thing that's stored in the plan cache is that parameterized query. So every time I run this, this stored proc from now on, until that plan gets out of memory or out of the plan cache, I'm going to get this bad plan. Okay, that's parameter sniffing, and it's terrible. And it happens a lot, but it happens by design. We, like I said, we don't want to be compiling queries every time if we don't have to. That's time we can't get back. CPUs are expensive. Memory, not so expensive. But you know, it's, it's one of those things we want to try to avoid. Now, there's a couple different ways we can deal with this problem. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are not. The first way you can deal with it is you can modify your stored pre procedure to say with recompile. This is a knee-jerk reaction. It is a nuclear option. Because if you do this, this means every time you run this stored procedure, SQL Server will recompile it and make a new plan. This can be bad. It'll fix your immediate problem. And maybe you modify it once to force the recompile and then get rid of the recompile so it gets a better plan. But this can be really bad. Because if it's a really busy stored procedure, and let's say it takes 15 milliseconds to compile this plan every time, and I'm executing this stored procedure thousands of times per second, that's a lot of CPU scheduling that is taking away resources from other parts of my queries. Not great. But it can fix your problem immediately. I don't recommend it. If I add this to my stored procedure, and then execute this down here, I will now get a different plan for each execution. Because every time it runs, we told SQL Server, recompile it every time. So I still got what SQL Server, <clears throat> what, excuse me, what SQL Server considers to be the best plan for my first query. Even though it's a scan, it still thinks it's less expensive than the other query. And I got my better plan for the state province ID that actually could benefit from an index seek. Now, if you don't want to do that, 
Another trick is, and this is us trying to be smarter than the optimizer, your mileage may vary, we can tell SQL Server to optimize this query for a particular value. Let's look at this statement real quick. Same query, no more recompile, but I'm basically telling it, I want you to optimize this query as if I had passed value 55. Okay, optimize for this particular value. Doesn't matter what value I give it, always optimize the plan so it looks like this. We'll modify our stored proc and we'll run it again. And now I get the same plan for both. Okay? Roughly 50% of the cost goes in both sections. Okay? It kind of it just basically said each one of these plans costs exactly the same now. Is that good? Well, it's good for where you have a lot of data, maybe your data is skewed a particular way. You kind of have to know that, right? You need to know your data before you can do things like that. But if you know you have a significant data skew, you can optimize for that value and get better plans out of your stored procedures. Okay? That's, that's parameter sniffing. Now your other option, and your DBA will hate you if you try to do this, don't run that. Because that dumps every single plan out of memory, and they all have to recompile. Don't ever do that. OK. The next thing that can be terrible in SQL Server. Table variables. Who here has used a table variable? OK, why? Table variables are one of those things that a lot of people stumble upon, and they think, wow, this is great. I have a variable that can be a table. And I can store it in memory, and I can reuse it, and I can write queries against it, and do all kinds of things. Table variables have one very significant drawback. You can't get column statistics about it. They're great if you only have a little bit of data in your table variable, but the minute you start to scale up, it gets bad in a hurry. And we'll see an example of that. The other myth about table variables is that they don't get written to disk. That is false. They will get written to tempdb if they get big enough. So just be wary of that. So what does that look like? Well, let's say I declare a table variable called customers with these columns in it. And then I insert, a rec I, I insert one record to, into it, and then I'm going to do a select star from it and do a join to it. Hmm, I didn't get any results. That's cool. Um, here's what my query plan thinks it looks like. And this is a multi-statement batch, so I need to scroll down to where I actually have the query. Again, a little more complex. There's, doing, there's a lot of things going on in this query. First things first, though, I have this table scan on my, oops, let me zoom in a little bit. I have a table scan on my customer's, ta on my customer's table variable. Okay? Actual number of rows returned, one. Estimated number of rows, one. Perfect. It came up with a great plan. Did a nested loop join to this index seek, and everything's happy. But if we start scaling this query up, okay, and I'm going to declare the same table variable again, but this time I'm going to put 5,000 records in it and select from it again, what does that query look like? Well, it looks the same. But now I have a problem. Is a nested loop the best thing we can do with this particular query? I mouse over this guy. Actual number of rows, 5,000. Estimated number of rows, 1. Okay? This isn't a great scaling example, but this, I just want to highlight why every time you have a table variable, SQL Server thinks you're only ever going to get one row back. And what happens when we get mismatched estimates? We don't get the best plan all the time. So it's going to throw it over here to this nested loop join. right? Estimated number of rows. It thought it was only going to get 1.6 rows, which, again, it's an estimate. You can't have less than one row, right? You get, it's actually saying you get four, you, we're actually going to get 4,480 rows back, OK? SQL Server may not have chosen the best type of join for this, because it only thought it was going to get one row. That's not great. Your alternatives to this are two things. One, we can actually create an actual temp table. You know, create table pound customers, right? We're actually going to create a table on disk for real this time. And then I'm going to select from it. Same exact thing, same columns, everything is the same. But I got a vastly different plan this time. I, got, I was able to use a merge join, which the data was already in the same order, so I just kind of put all that together. 
And then I took everything up here from this table scan and did a hash match to it because, you know, it said I have these number of rows and I had a pretty large data set. I'm actually pulling back 121,000 rows. Nope. Yeah, 121,000 rows from this guy. And then I'm hash matching it to that other 5,000. Is a hash match the best join we can get for this? Yeah, maybe we could tune it a little bit. But you can see how the plan is vastly different and all we did was change the table type. SQL Server said this is a way better query than the other one. Okay? That's why table variables can get you into trouble. If you have stored procs or you have other you know, things written in SQL today that utilize uh, table variables, take a minute in your dev or int or QA environments and try changing the temp tables and see what your performance looks like. Because if it's an actual temp table, you can get column statistics on it. You can also index them. So if you have some large batch process that you need to run, I've got 10 minutes left, you can actually index them or create primary keys on them and treat them like any other table. And then as soon as your session's closed, they go away. OK? So table variables, not always great. OK, next thing. Now I want to talk about my favorite topic, cursors. Yuck. Cursors are bad. Um, I keep a knife at my desk. And uh, I want to say it's for protection, but it's just for protection against cursors. There's a lot of people that work at IGS that are nodding their heads right now. But I kid, OK? Cursors do have a time and a place. I can't always tell you that we're going to know the right time to use them, OK? If you have some sort, if you have any sort of OLTP workload, try to avoid cursors if you can, OK? I'm going to show you what a plan looks like when we use them, but spoiler alert, we're going to kill it with fire because it's just terrible. All right, so let's say I have a cursor. What do cursors look like in query plans? So let's say we screwed up. Okay? We're, we're, a, we're a company that we send things out to people, and you know, we made a mistake, and we misspelled somebody's name wrong on a product, which may or may not have happened to me very recently. I want to begin a transaction. I'm going to declare a bunch of variables for my cursor. Who here has written cursors in T-SQL before? More of you than I was hoping. All right, so some of this code probably looks familiar for you. But the basic thing about a cursor is we write a select statement, and we put that into a cursor, which is just giantly, you know, like, kind of like an iterative list. And then we open that thing, and we constantly fetch each row until we can't fetch any more. Now, this is like cursor 101 that I see developers write. I've got two tables that are related to each other. What I need to do is insert a record into one, find the value of the primary key I inserted, and then use that value to insert into the other table. Right? We have some kind of foreign key constraint that we need to keep track of. So what do I do? I use my old friend, scope identity, to pull out the value of the row I just inserted, and then I insert it into the next one. What does that do? Well, let's actually run this. Okay? And I'm actually going to turn off my actual execution plan. Well, no, I'll leave it on. What the hell? Let's run that, okay? And we're just going to watch this little timer down here. I have no idea how many rows this is going to update, okay? Are you not entertained? All right, so let's stop this. What's happening? Well, we can see behind the scenes, if I look at this execution plan, I actually have a lot of execution plans because I'm executing a query over and over and over again. I had to generate a plan for each one of these and do each insert individually. We call that rebar. And the reason we call it rebar is we're doing a row by row operation. It also means that I want to hit you with a piece of rebar. <laughs> Let's roll that back. How do we get around cursors? Well, in this particular case, again, cursors 101, right? Let's do something a little bit differently. Okay? The first thing I want to do to get rid of my cursor is figure out how I can capture the values coming out of that insert and then reuse them. Let's start by beginning a transaction, and I'm going to create a temporary table called new sales. So every new sale that I'm entering. Then I'm going to insert into sales order header. The magic is going to happen on this particular statement called output. Output is a statement you can use in SQL Server that captures the output of what you inserted. Try to wrap your head around that one. Every time you do an insert and update or delete option in SQL Server, there are secret little tables behind the scene for your transaction called inserted or deleted. Okay? If you're inserting a row, it actually captures the value that you inserted before it commits it to the table. We can leverage that secret inserted table to find out what the new IDs are of what we just inserted. Then, well, actually, before we get to the then, let's just run this part. 
So let's create my table and actually do the insert. OK, that was pretty fast. And if I come down here, I captured all of that output to my new sales table. So here are all my values that I inserted into that sales table. So then it just becomes another set-based operation to say, insert into sales order detail and use that select statement with these traditional values. Still not a great insert, right? And we're going to see why in a second. OK, that took six seconds you know, compared to the never of my other query. So I'll consider that a good improvement, right? What did that look like? Well, the reason that that still took a little while, and we're not seeing it here, again, and this is why estimated plans aren't always great, is there are a ton of triggers, my other favorite thing to talk about, and a bunch of other foreign key constraints on this table that SQL Server has to check for every insert. We can make that a set-based operation as well. And that type of stuff won't necessarily show up in an estimated plan. But that's why that insert still took six seconds. But six seconds is better than never. Okay, So cursors, yuck. Destroy them. Stop using them. OK, so in my five minutes left, let's go ahead and wrap this baby up. So a couple of the things I want to quickly mention, and I didn't have a really good, I didn't have a lot of time to show you. In SQL Server 2016, actually, I do have time to show you this because it's that important to me. SQL Server 2016 has a really cool new feature called Live Query Execution. So before, we've seen actual and we've seen estimates, right? That's actually not going to work. Let's go down here to the bottom. OK, so I'm going to use my Stack Overflow database real quick. And I'm actually going to dump my plan cache and dump my memory. Do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to run this select statement. Now, in SQL Server 2016, there's a new fancy button that has this little arrow. Include live query statistics. This is exciting, I promise. We click this guy. Okay, that means that any time we run a query now, we get something that looks like this. Aww. <laughs> red, I almost made it. Almost made it without red text. Damn it. All right, let's try that again. I get live query statistics of what's actually happening on each step. That's pretty cool. Okay? That's actually really freaking cool. Now, good news, good news. You can actually get this in SQL Server 2014. I want to say it was SQL Server 2014, one of the more recent service packs to introduce this functionality into it. So for those of you fortunate enough to be using SQL Server 2014 in production today, get the latest version of SQL Server Management Studio. That button should be there. All it's doing is there's certain new dynamic management views behind the scenes that can query these different operations as they're happening and then return to you how, much, how long each step takes. Pretty cool stuff. Really, really handy. Okay. The other thing that's coming in SQL Server 2016 is a thing called the Plan Store. And the Plan Store is Microsoft's new way of offering you ways to deal with parameter sniffing. What the Plan Store does is it keeps track of all the different query plans for a given query, whether or not it's in memory. So in that parameter sniffing example, I can actually have that query go into the cache. And then if we make a change to the proc, or even if we don't make a change to the proc, SQL Server will keep statistics about those different plans and how they're changing over time and if they're regressing. Don't have a good demo for that, because I just don't have the time to really go into it. But that lets you look at different plans as they're changing, and that, gives, that can give your DBAs or you a clue to say, man, I really need to look at some of these queries and rewrite them. And the other thing I would say is, if you're, if you're going to spend time working with query plans, I always recommend everybody downloads, and I don't work for them. I just really like them a lot. Download SQL Sentry's Plan Explorer. Okay? It can take your output of your execution plans and render them, like and color code them and show you where expensive operations are, give you a better way to look. And then as you tune your queries, it'll keep stats about each time you run it and give you some more information. So it's pretty neat. So SQL Server execution plans. Hopefully, you're going to leave here today with an understanding of what they are, why they're useful, and how we can look at them to read them. Um, and again, as you're making changes, Try to keep track of things like statistics I.O., query execution times. Look for ways that you're making it better. Measure it incrementally. And then you know, work with your DBA. You know, I love working with developers. I love tuning SQL. I mean, it's part of the reason I'm here. You know, buy your DBA a beer always. Stay on their good side. 
I would recommend that if you are interested in this, I mean, I only have an hour, there's only so much I can do. You can spend days on this stuff. You can really get deep into the engine to learn more about it. The plan operator reference on MSDN lists every single possible operator you could see in a query plan in a description. Definitely check that out. If you see a plan operator and you don't know what it means, that's where you can find more. There are people who are way better at query plans than I am, and if they ever see this presentation, they'll probably yell at me because I probably gave you a bunch of bad information. The first is Brent Ozar Unlimited. Uh, he does a ton of stuff with uh, performance tuning in SQL Server. Check him out. The other is Grant Fritchie, who is also known as the Scary DBA. He's really good. He's actually written physical, you know, paper tree killing books and ebooks on execution plans, and I recommend that. I'd also be remiss to say that if you do use SQL Server a lot, please consider coming out to SQL Saturday Columbus. It's part of the PASS organization, free to all. Doesn't cost anything to get in. It's a free full day of SQL Server training. I'm on the board, full disclosure. So again, my contact information is here, guys. I'm about all the time. I really hope this was helpful for you. Please stop by, let me know how I did, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>